Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I have once again four pages of questions from the awesome folks on Patreon who make Forgotten Weapons happen. Uh, normally I also have a bit of a, a uh, an adult beverage here, but uh, normally I'm filming these in the evening, and today I'm filming this in the morning, so we'll uh, pass on that for the moment. And we'll dive right into our first question, which is from Aaron, who says, What are you using to teach yourself French? The primary uh, electronic tool that I'm using is a program called Duolingo, which seems to be pretty decent, um, pretty good. Of course, like any online tool like that, it's only as good as the effort that you put into it, and I am trying to combine that with uh, you know, exposing myself to French language in other places, reading things that are written online, uh, watching and listening to French media, uh, movies, YouTube channels, uh, conversations with friends who speak French, that sort of thing. So I probably ought to be doing more, uh, but it's all it's all a balance. Anyway, Duolingo seems like a pretty good tool. If there's a language you're interested in trying to learn, especially just the basics, definitely check it out. It's also free. They have a paid version, but the, the basic version is 100% free. The second question is from Woody, who says, How difficult is it to obtain a CNR license? Are CNR eligible firearms able to be shipped directly to the buyer, or do they need to ship to an actual FFL? Uh, well, so for those of you who aren't aware, a CNR is a curio and relic, and it is a specific category of federal firearms license. It is a type 03 federal firearms license. And uh, just to, to put the right context on this, Woody, a CNR license is an actual federal firearms license. It's not a fake sort of FFL. It is a real FFL, just one that has a couple of limitations. Specifically, it applies to firearms that are more than 50 years old as of current day. So that's a, a rolling date. Every, you know, every year CNR applies to guns that are one year newer. Uh, and uh, it also applies to guns that are considered CNR guns uh, for virtue of any special historic or collectible interest, and there are a number of less than 50 year old guns that are accepted as CNR guns. ATF has a whole manuscript, a whole list of guns that apply as CNR. Now, how hard is it to get? It is extremely easy to get. There is a single standard form that you fill out to apply for a federal firearms license that requires things like photos and fingerprints, uh, but if you are applying for a CNR license, you specifically get to skip all of that. You basically you fill out one form with name and address and like where you actually are, where your collection um, is housed. Well, not even where your collection is housed, but the address where you collect. Um, so the address that guns can be sent to. And then you fill out a second form, which is essentially a 4473. Uh, the FBI does a background check on you, basically the exact same check that they would do when you purchase a gun. It, uh, you have to submit a check, or a money order I think, for all of $30, which gives you three years of CNR license. It is extremely easy, it takes a couple weeks to process, and then you'll get your license back. The downside is it is an extremely expensive license to own, because once you have it, uh, everything that any gun that is CNR eligible can be shipped directly to you, because you are now a federally licensed, well a federal firearms licensee, authorized to receive firearms at your home in this case. So very easy to get. Beware of the impact it will have on your pocketbook, because all of a sudden it gets really easy to buy cool antique, well cool CNR and antique guns, and you don't have to pay other people for transfers, and you don't have to arrange going to a shop to pick them up. You just uh, send the seller a copy of your CNR license and some money, and uh, a week later, boom, gun appears at your door. It's pretty cool. Craig uh, asks for thoughts on FB radoms return to the US commercial market. There are two ways I would, two things that I'm aware of in this space. Uh, one of them is for a couple of years now, uh, radom has been looking at the at the potential to remanufacture the Viz 35, what is often called the radom pistol in the US, uh, essentially sort of more or less a 9mm 1911 with a decocker. I don't think that's going anywhere. I think they are. Last I heard, what they were trying to find is someone who was willing to buy enough of the guns as a minimum initial order to pay for the, all of the tooling and everything uh, to set production back up. And I don't think anyone's going to be that interested in doing that. Because frankly, original Viz 35s are expensive, uh, 
but they're not that expensive, and most of the people who want one would rather, I think, get an original one, even if it costs a little more, than get a reproduction one. The reproduction ones are not going to be particularly practical and modern by today's standards, because it's a single stack steel frame 9mm, uh, large, you know, it's too big to be a good you know, pocket gun. So I don't think that that plan is ever going to really get any traction. Uh, and then also a FB Radom is importing AKs, and they're modern, basically semi-auto sporting versions of the uh, barrel, the current military Polish AK. But the problem is most of what makes the barrel interesting as a gun, at least to me, is the three round burst mechanism. And of course the semi-auto guns don't have any of that. So they get rid of the selector switch on the left side, it's just gone completely, and it's essentially a standard AK with some different furniture. It's fine, there, I don't know that there's anything wrong with them, but there's nothing that makes them really jump out, at least to my mind. So I suspect that as long as they can offer those at competitive prices they will do fine in the US market, and hopefully they can bring out some other, other stuff that's a little more unusual and a little more distinctively uh, Radom and Polish. That'd be fun to see. Uh, Sean says, does adding things like optics to pistol slides or doing aftermarket milling on slides affect unlocking time and slide velocity? Does this negatively affect reliability? It can, depending on a number of factors. It depends on how much mass you are adding or removing from a pistol slide, and what the basically what the margin of, of reliability is on that particular gun. Will that gun operate with 10% less mass in the slide? 20? 30? I don't think you're ever going to get really 30% less mass. A lot of the competitive shooters who are doing this are combining milling of the slide with a lightened recoil spring, and the idea is to have uh, less reciprocating mass. You reduce the recoil spring strength to kind of balance it out, and and maintain the reliability of the gun. I don't know, of, I, I would be more concerned with milling of the slide impacting reliability than adding a red dot sight, because most of the red dots are relatively light, and you have I think more margin of error with adding mass to the slide than you do with removing it. Uh, now there may be a, that may be a little bit different if you're using super light hand loads, but of course if you're using hand loads and it turns out that they're a little too light to operate your pistol reliably, you can always bump up the powder a little bit in the, in your own hand loads. With factory ammunition I don't think you're going to run into any issues with just the standard mounting of red dots on slides, especially these days when a lot of manufacturers are including slide cuts on their pistols to begin with, they're anticipating that you're going to be adding a couple of ounces to the slide in the form of a red dot, and they have done their due diligence and ensured that the pistol will continue to run reliably with that weight added. Creative Cat asks, what are your thoughts on the Maxim Tokarev, and do you think you'll ever get your hands on one to video? Hopefully I will get my hands on one to video, I don't know exactly when. I think it's a really interesting gun for a couple reasons. I think mechanically they're interesting. There were a number of different variations on them that I've seen pictures of, but essentially what we're talking about is a Maxim receiver box with an air-cooled barrel shroud instead of the water jacket, and then some form of, well, and a bipod, and some form of shoulder stock and single finger trigger instead of the spade grips from an original Maxim. I think historically they're interesting because the Russians, and I talked about this in a video on the Degturev machine guns a couple weeks ago, the Russians decided to adopt that in the mid-1920s, kind of following the German MG0815 line of development instead of looking for something that was more portable. I think they were, they were interested in the firepower that was available from a belt-fed heavy light machine gun, instead of focusing on the portability of a gun that was magazine-fed. So they're, they're cool guns. Uh, they were produced in Russia, they're, I, sorry, I don't think there are hardly any here in the United States, I will probably have to find one in a museum overseas at some point in order to film. Kyle says, would an, an 1895 Nagant style action and cartridge lend itself to being the quietest suppressed repeating arm? Was this design philosophy ever tinkered with enough to matter? So what he's talking about is a revolving cylinder that dovetail or that has a nesting cone and essentially locks itself, moves forward and locks itself into the barrel when it's being fired, combined with a cartridge 
where the brass is long enough to actually span that, bridge that gap over a cylinder gap, and uh, thus give you a gas seal despite having a revolver. Now, is that going to work well as a suppressed firearm? Yes it will, however it's not going to work any better than any other style of manually operated firearm. So if you have a bolt action rifle, you've got the same effective setup as you would with a Nagant revolver. Because there is no cylinder gap, your, the, the breech end of the gun is locked, is sealed by the brass cartridge, and none of the, there's no gas that's going to come out the back until you manually open the action. So a semi-auto will generate noise from the ejection port because it's opening and extracting the cartridge while there's still pressure in the chamber and barrel, and that pressure is going to make a pop when it comes out the ejection port. It's not something that we really normally pay attention to with an unsuppressed firearm, because of course it's a lot quieter than the noise coming out of the muzzle. But there's nothing special about a Nagant style revolver over a bolt action, or a lever action, or a pump action, or any other non-semi-automatic uh, suppressed firearm. And nobody has ever really done that much work, uh, developmental work, with Nagant style gas seal revolvers. There have been a couple, um, the Mexican military, or Mexican, uh, some some of element of Mexican government security forces at least adopted a revolving carbine in the 1890s that used that same principle, but that's kind of about it. The problem is the cartridge is not really conducive to any other practical use. Having the brass extend beyond the bullet makes the brass long, it makes it awkward, it's effectively, it's kind of like trying to run wad cutters in everything. So any sort of repeating arm it's going to be very difficult to get the guns to, to cycle reliably with that style of cartridge, and the, the suppression capability was never really a big benefit to anybody who was willing to put money into it. Matthew says, with a company like Arex, uh, known for their superior quality, would a nation ever consider adopting the Rex-01 or the Delta as their primary sidearm? I would be extremely doubtful that they ever would. The problem is sidearms aren't really that important to a military, and spending a ton of money on a really high-end sidearm is something that is very unlikely. And we see that in modern firearms procurement. It ultimately, there, there's going to be a set of standards of what's the minimum practical capability of the gun, and then uh, the firearms trial essentially determines which guns meet that minimum spec, and then the one that they choose to adopt is the one that meets the spec and costs the least. Uh, incorporating things like uh, training costs, documentation, spare parts, possibly ammunition supply, all the other ancillary costs beyond just the gun itself. And uh, the idea that like militaries don't get much use out of handguns. It's your military policemen need them there, but honestly they tend to be as much tokens as they are uh, essential actual combat weapons, and it's just not worth it. Take that money that you would spend on really fancy sidearms and spend it on something that's going to be more likely to actually see practical use. Chris asks, why do you think the 1906 Luger rifle never caught on? Two reasons. First off, well the big reason, the big problem is it wasn't really submitted to that many people for testing. Uh, when it came to the US it was in the wrong caliber and it was immediately scrapped from the, you know, dropped from the competition. Uh, I don't know that it would have, even if everything had gone right and DWM had put a lot of, of effort and energy into pushing it and marketing it and trying to develop it, I think that style of toggle action system in a rifle was a dead end that ultimately was not going to go very far. But then I think the big issue was DWM was too busy working with pistols. There is an opportunity cost to trying to market a rifle version of this system when you've got a bunch of orders backed up and you've got pistol trials that you're trying to take part in, negotiate deals with countries for pistol production, you can't necessarily do everything. And it makes sense that a company would tend to focus on the areas that it thinks are going to pay off the best. And we see that with the 45 caliber Luger in US trials, where the gun actually does pretty darn well in, in US preliminary testing, but DWM uh, decides it's not worth manufacturing a couple hundred of these guns in a specific special caliber for the US 
turns it down. Uh, Savage, as the runner-up, gets to be the contender against the Colt Browning, which and the Colt Browning ultimately wins. So would it have been worth DWM's time to actually further to, to put that the 45 caliber Luger pistol into further production if they suspected they were going to lose and they were going, you know, in order to do that, they're going to have to not do something else involved in getting a more likely contract for 9mm or uh, 7.65 caliber Luger pistols. I think the same thing is going on with the rifles. You're going to have to dedicate a lot of time and energy to get that rifle version in some form of militarily acceptable level of development. And I don't think it was worth it, and I think DWM recognized that that wasn't the strong suit of this action, and so they just didn't really, basically they just didn't try very hard. Joe says, the RSC 1917 has a rather strange method of reload with uh, sticking an end block clip directly into the bottom of the receiver with little in the way of confirmation when it is in place. Yep, that is correct. Is there a specific reason why they couldn't set up the rifle to accept the end blocks normally through the top of the rifle, which might have resulted in it standardizing on Berthier clips prior to 1918? Is this a case of they didn't think about it, or was it an effort to mitigate mud ingress, or some other perfectly logical reason? Uh, we're going to go with option C here, some other logical reason. That reason being a combination of things. There was an effort to get the rifle developed relatively quickly, a lot more quickly than you would typically do for a military self-loader. Uh, because this was developed during World War I, uh, and it was an offshoot, more or less, of the Shosha automatic rifle or light machine gun. The design team was the same. Uh, the Shosha is the CSRG, and they are the RS and C in that are the same RS and C in the 1917 rifle. Uh, Sutter, and Shosha. And the Shosha was designed with a rotating bolt that fed from the bottom. And I think what was going on was they didn't want to take the time to try and completely redesign the system to accept ammunition from the top instead of the bottom. Instead they wanted to be able to maintain use of some of the basic fundamental design aspects that already existed in the Shosha. Now that bottom feed actually didn't inhibit uh, RSCs from using Berthier clips. The reason that they used their own clip was because the five round Berthier clip was developed basically concurrently with the RSC by a different design team. So had, had the Berthier been a five round gun in 1914 when the war started, the RSC undoubtedly would have used that same clip. Or had the RSC not been developed until after the M16 updates of the, the Berthier, and just looking at the numbers, it sounds like it was 16 versus 17. In fact, the two patterns were developed simultaneously, and the 1916 updates actually didn't get into manufacture until a bit late, uh, later than 1916. So there are good reasons for it, um, and I think that's why. Jesse says, have you seen the rare breed FRT15 trigger, and what are your thoughts on the forced reset trigger in general? Well, uh, I am not a lawyer, but I have a friend, Matt LaRossier, who is a lawyer. He runs the YouTube channel Fudbusters, which has some, I think, really good, uh, really good coverage of firearms legalities, firearms legal myths. And so I asked Matt if he would uh, be willing to give us a little guest clip with his thoughts on the FRT. So Matt, take it away. Hey guys. So Ian asked me to talk a little bit about the rare breed FRT. He asked me the very simple and pointed question of whether I thought it was legal and what I thought about it generally. So the thing that's important to do here is to start with looking at the law. And a lot of people kind of skip steps, which I think is problematic. They'll look at some perceived end result or they'll look at just their gut feeling and decide that something falls within a certain statutory definition. And I think that's the wrong way of doing it. We have to look at the definition of a machine gun, which is a weapon which shoots or is designed to shoot more than one shot with a single function of the trigger. Now note that it says function and not pull, and note also that when this law was drafted they knew that there was a distinction in these terms. This also covers devices whose sole purpose is to convert what is not a machine gun into a machine gun, and of course those devices then, when it converts that, we relate back to that de definition, right? More than one shot without manually reloading with a single function of the trigger. 
So I've actually talked at length with the owner and designer of the Rare Breed FRT, and he's actually a lawyer like myself. He's actually also a Florida lawyer. And the Rare Breed FRT, the way I look at it, it's very clearly a trigger which was designed by a lawyer not to be a machine gun under the statute. So for those of you who don't know, it basically, it's a semi-automatic trigger where you pull the trigger and when the bolt goes home, it forces your finger off. So for it to fire again, you do need to make that additional rearward functioning of the trigger. What I found when I was preparing to do the segment for Ian is that ATF had already attempted to do some enforcement actions against Rarebreed. Rarebreed had gotten served basically a cease and desist letter from ATF and ATF was saying that these are machine guns and within five days you're going to meet with us to figure out how we're going to get them all back. So when Rare Breed met with ATF, they asked, well, hey, you know, how did you determine it was a machine gun? And they said, well, they, they had tested it. Okay, well, where's the test report? And no one in the room <laughs> could, could say anything about having actually seen any actual reports or knowing anything about that testing. So I think that's really problematic. So right now, Rare Breed is suing in the Middle District of Florida to enjoin ATF from basically making good on their threat to prosecute Rare Breed over the continued manufacture of this device and also keep them from having to disclose confidential customer information. Now, what I see a lot of people saying online, which I also think is a problem, are people who are like, oh, well, they never got an ATF determination letter, so they're getting what's coming to them. Well, that's not really the right way of approaching things. For one, the law does not require you to get a determination letter for pretty much anything in this space. As long as you are following the law, there is no requirement to get a determination letter. Also, even if you do get a determination letter, it gives you no legal protection whatsoever. So what Rare Breed actually did was before making the trigger, they sought professional advice from people who had worked for the ATF that were like ATF top dogs and that ATF had repeatedly in the past used as experts in cases that were determining what the definition of a machine gun was and what whether or not a particular weapon fell within that statutory definition. So they sent out this trigger to those experts and the experts came back unanimously with the opinion that this was not within the statutory definition of a machine gun. And I tend to agree with them. I do not think that it fires more than one shot with a single function of the trigger. I also don't think bump stocks work that way. And we know how that kind of went. It's very clear to me from some conversations I've had with ATF special agents and other people within the Bureau that there is a culture of hostility towards, you know, actions that they perceive as, you know, being spit in their eye or, you know, pointing out the Emperor's clothes. They really get frustrated with that. And it seems that sometimes they're willing to take actions that are not consistent with the Administrative Procedures Act in order to try to prevent these types of products from coming out. According to my gut, this seems more like that. And that ties into the whole determination letter thing, too. It isn't on the government in our system to tell us what is permitted. It is on the government, it is their burden, to tell us what is forbidden. So if you're to ask me, do I think the Rare Breed FRT is a machine gun? No, I do not. However, how this case goes is really anyone's guess. All right, there's something that I want to add to Matt's excellent commentary here, and that is, first off, I will be very surprised if this doesn't get ruled a machine gun. Whether it should be or not, by the letter of the law, I suspect FRT triggers are going to become felonies. And I want to make sure that people realize that if that happens, the company, the manufacturer, is under absolutely no obligation to refund anyone's money. And the government is certainly under no obligation to refund anyone's money. If ATF successfully determines that this thing is a machine gun, and deems that it's a felony to possess one, buyers, legally, would have to destroy them, or turn them in. And they will get no compensation back. And we're talking about a trigger that is, if I recall correctly, upwards of $400. So I would strongly recommend that anyone who's considering buying one of these, don't buy it unless you are willing to see it become a felony with no uh, financial recourse on your own part. It's an expensive item, and 
I think there may be some misunderstandings about what exactly would happen if it does become determined to be a machine gun. So caveat emptor here is, I think, the biggest thing to keep in mind if you're considering getting one of these. Anyway, uh, big thanks to Matt for contributing that guest segment. Definitely check out his channel if you're interested in that sort of legal issue. I'll include a link to it in the description text below. And our next question is from Doug, who said, You have said before that the M1 Garand is an excellent rifle, but the M14 kind of sucks, despite it being basically an M1 with a box magazine. Do you think the M14 is actually inferior to the M1, or is it just in comparison to all of its contemporaries and how long it took to develop? Two-part answer here. Uh, as far as the rifle itself, one example sitting in front of you, I don't think... I, the M14 is a better gun than the M1 by a very small margin. Um, it is... does have box magazines, uh, it is a little bit lighter, which is nice. Um, a lot of the fundamentals of the, the shooting fundamentals of the gun are the same. The sights are essentially the same. The trigger is essentially the same. The stock is essentially the same. But you do get a little bit bigger capacity. Where the M14 really fell apart is twofold. First, the opportunity cost of adopting it. The fact that it took like 12 years to do what the Italians did in like two years, putting a box magazine on the thing. Now in the US they did also change the, the gas system around. It's still a gas piston, but it's a very different style of gas piston on the M14 that they thought would be a benefit that honestly isn't really a benefit. But the other problem was in the industrial production of the M14. M1 production went relatively smoothly. There were of course problems that had to be fixed. But the M1 was able to be tooled up and manufactured in massive numbers, millions of the things, uh, in a fairly short time period, once the design was finished, and, and served well. The M14 had tremendous quality control problems that just kind of ricocheted through its entire production life. And that's where the real problem with the M14 as a military firearm lies, I think, is in the, the industrial engineering that went in, or failed to go into, its development. So, and then of course if you compare the M14 to its contemporaries in 1957, I think it is definitely lagging behind. Our next question is from Mausermaniac792, who says, I have a question regarding Finnish captured small arms. Did the Finns capture and mark 1895 Nagant revolvers, or were they just considered poor enough that the time wasn't taken to stamp the boxed SA on them? By the way, the SA in a little rectangle is a Finnish military property mark. Uh, SA stands for Finnish Army in Finnish. Uh, or were they just not a common thing to capture on the battlefield? One would think Finland would take in just about any arms they could find during the Winter War and the Continuation War. Indeed the Finnish Army would take on just about anything that they could find and get their hands on. And there actually were a lot of 1895 Nagant revolvers used by the Finnish military in the Winter War and the Continuation War. In fact, not only were they captured in those two conflicts, but there are actually a reasonable number of 1895 Nagant revolvers that were in Finnish hands uh, in 1918 when the country declared independence, or at least by 1920. Uh, there were guns that had been issued to Russian troops who were in Finland, and most of those guns eventually found their way into Finnish military stockpiles. Well, most of the rifles did anyway. The problem, the exception that applies to the 1895 Nagant revolvers here is that they were handguns, and kind of like American soldiers in this way, Finnish soldiers really liked having handguns. And they were loath to turn them in to the unit authorities, where they would be uh, overhauled and marked and inventoried and issued as the Finnish army thought was appropriate. And because the Finnish army isn't going to issue a handgun to most people. So most of the soldiers, if they capture an enemy handgun like a Tokarev or an 1895 Nagant, they're going to keep it, much like US soldiers capturing German handguns in particular. They're going to keep that thing, uh, not really tell anyone about it, and when the war ends they're going to take it home. And that applied to the Finnish Civil War as well as the Winter War and the Continuation War. So there were 1895 Nagants that were in official government inventory, but never more than a couple hundred at any time. Not because they weren't being used, but because no one was willing to give them back to the army. Uh, next question is Rebel Alliance Shooter, who says, 
Uh, which, in your opinion, doomed the SKS from ever having a spot as a long-term mainline infantry rifle in a major country? The non-detachable magazines, the no full auto setting, or the fact that it uses a machined and not stamped receiver? I will go with option A this time, the non-detachable magazine. Which ironically is actually sort of detachable, but no one ever made a standard detachable box magazine, except for the Chinese in commercial production to sell to the US. So uh, as far as the not having a full auto switch, I don't think that's really that big of a deal. Uh, there were a lot of other small arms infantry semi-auto rifles at the time. Full auto is not, not really an issue, I don't think. As far as using a milled instead of a stamped receiver, there were actually stamped receiver SKSs developed by the Chinese. So that certainly could have been done had they wanted to. I think the issue is the fixed 10 round magazine, which really limits the firepower of the rifle. We see that showing up in a couple of places right after World War II. The SKS is a good example. The FN Model 49 is another good example. And then after those two, basically everyone decides to go to at least detachable magazines, generally 20 or 30 rounds. The only exception I can think of off the top of my head is the French, who had a detachable mag, but only 10 round capacity to it. So um, the other thing that really hurt the SKS in this case was the fact that the AK had been developed at basically the same time, and what they realized is this AK that we intended to be used in more of a submachine gun role, it uses the same cartridge, it basically does everything the SKS does, plus it does some other things, so let's just use that. Um, had the AK not been around, had, for example, the Red Army continued to use Papa Shah submachine guns or Sudayev submachine guns, then I think you might have an interesting situation where they would have uh, improved the SKS and given it a detachable box magazine, perhaps ending up with something that looks more like one of the Chinese rifles, the Type 63 or the Type 81, that's sort of an SKS-AK hybrid. Uh, but because the SKS was limited by its magazine size, and there was already a totally acceptable replacement in production right there, the SKS goes away. Next up is from Ethan, who says, How easy would it be to convert 303 to a rimless cartridge and to improve its ballistics? You would think a more efficient bullet design and rimless conversion would be cheap and easy enough for the British to have been able to do uh, in the interwar period. Uh, what would a conversion to rimless entail on a technical level? Not very much. You need look no farther than in Arasaka to see that, because essentially 7.7 uh, seven seven Japanese is rimless 303 British. Um, like, basically that that's what that is. Um, they had rimmed cartridges initially, and realized uh, in particular when developing uh, tank machine guns, converting the ZB26 to the Type 97 to use in Japanese tanks, the rimmed cartridge is not like, it'd be a lot easier to do this with a rimless version of, of our cartridge. And so you get a 7.7 seven rimless, and that's essentially 303. Uh, you don't really have to do much at all to the gun uh, to go from rimmed to rimless. A little bit of a redesign of the magazine follower to get the proper contour of the cartridge. Redesign slightly of the bolt face to fit the proper diameter and the extractor uh, to fit over the over well into the extractor groove instead of just over a rim, but very simple. Now, why didn't the British do it? Basically, the British didn't need to do it. Uh, there was nothing. the The rimmed cartridge worked just fine in their Enfield family of rifles. The rimmed cartridge worked great in the Vickers gun. In fact, the Vickers gun really kind of works better. Like it's designed for a rimmed cartridge. It works really well with a rimmed cartridge. Not that it doesn't work with rimless, but there's no incentive to swap to a rimless cartridge if you're an army that is running Lee Enfield rifles and Vickers machine guns. The Bren gun was able to do it as well, but by the Bren gun we're getting towards the end of the interwar period, and had they decided in 36, 38 that maybe they wanted a rimless cartridge, it was kind of too late to try and, and convert and adapt. Uh, the Japanese did pull that off, although they continued to use 6.5 a lot in China. They, they didn't completely convert their military. The Italians tried to do a conversion like that, not from rimmed to rimless, but from 6.5 to 7.35, and kind of got halfway through and then gave up and went back because the logistics were too much of a problem. 
Uh, you certainly see it after the war, though. Uh, Molly says you've shot the Manuron, and you've had a chance to try. Have you had a chance to try the HK Mark Twenty Three? Both were the result of specific requests from special forces or special forces ish units. Which service do you think got the better deal, and why? I honestly don't know if I've ever shot a Mark Twenty Three, but I have shot USPs, and the Mark Twenty Three is just a big specialized USP. And I think that uh, GIGN got the better deal with the Menuron than anybody got with the HK-23. The reason being the practical benefits of the MR-73, the Menuron revolver, are a lot more useful than the practical benefits of the Mark-23. The Mark-23 is huge. Its, its capability to use more powerful cartridges, something more like a 45 Super, its capability to mount a suppressor, are just not really all that useful in the general context of a military handgun. It's something that could apply to a specific small group with a specific mission that needs those characteristics, whereas the MR73, what you get from it is a, a duty-sized handgun that has an incredible durability and capability for extended training with full power ammunition. Uh, now, the Mark 23 can do that too, but I, just, I think the MR73 is a more practical gun, and those guys got the better deal. And I think you see that with the long, the extended use of the MR73 uh, for several decades, and much wider acceptance, much wider issuance of the MR73 than you will ever see with the HK Mark 23. Uh, Jedo Stottel says, given the M1 carbine and 30 caliber cartridge, 30 carbine cartridge, were the tactical hot thing of the 1950s, leading to developments like the Kimball pistol, were there ever any revolvers chambered in 30 carbine at the time, ignoring the Ruger Blackhawk, given that it's single action uh, and wasn't introduced until 1968 in 30 carbine? And if there weren't any, why not? There weren't really any, and the reason why not is that rimless straight wall cartridges are not very well suited to revolvers. Um, actually, rimless straight wall is better than rimless necked, but rimless cartridges just generally aren't that great for revolvers, and 30 carbine doesn't really offer anything better than basically 357 Magnum. Uh, you're going to get, you're going to have a much easier time dealing with extraction and cylinder design on a 357. 357 is a very common, well accepted cartridge at that time already. 357 has a much wider array of ammunition available, different bullet weights, different bullet constructions. 30 carbine, you basically have one option, and that is 110 grain round nose ammo. Maybe soft point at some point, but you don't have a variety of bullet weights really available. Uh, and there, there's not enough benefit to a 30 carbine revolver to justify. Uh, the, the work that goes into it over a 357 revolver and an M1 carbine. Robert says, as you have traveled to far away and exotic places like France, Malta, and Wyoming, I'm sure you get plenty of questions regarding gun culture and laws in these places. I have no interest in that subject. What I would like to know is if there are any non-gun related cultural aspects you have seen in your travels that you wish would carry over to the US, or which you're glad have not carried over to the US. That's a question that could be an entire Q&A video on its own, I suspect. I will say the thing that I see overseas, not necessarily in Wyoming, that I would like to see more of here is more of a buy once, cry once sort of attitude of I'm going to save up and get one really good thing instead of uh, instead of getting several, instead of getting something cheap that's probably going to break, that I'll then have to replace again, and it'll break, and then I'll replace it again. Now, the reason that, as far as I see it, the reason that I, this exists in Europe, specifically when it comes to firearms, is most of the countries in Europe have limitations on how many guns you can own. And so once you've got a limit of, you can only have 10 or 12 firearms, there's a, an immediate obvious incentive to have good ones. Uh, where in the US there's no limit, you can buy as much as you want, which is as it should be. Uh, but it incentivizes people to be like, oh it's only 120 bucks, why not buy that Zip 22? 
basically no one in Europe would ever buy one of those guns, because it's going to take up a slot in one of their licenses, and it's a complete piece of garbage. So does it actually hurt me if people go buy junk guns? No, it totally doesn't. And everyone should be totally free to buy whatever it is that they want. But it would be nice to see people exercise a little more discretion sometimes. There's lots of marginal, substandard new production firearms in the US that just but they, like, you shouldn't be buying it. All right, our next question is from Edmund, and I think I accidentally cut a chunk of this out when I copied it to my sheet. So I'm going to paraphrase here. It's 1919, the trench hell is still a thing, the Pedersen device didn't do what was hoped, uh, thousands of doughboys die along with their wonder weapon in the French mud. Uh, the British start looking at submachine guns. Now the question here is, they're looking at the Lanchester, but in 455 Webley Automatic. Uh, would they have gone with a native cartridge over 9mm Parabellum? That's a really interesting question. Maybe. I think they might well have gone with 45 automatic. Uh, one thing to look at would be the manufacturing capacity that Britain had for submachine guns in 1918 or 1919. They may very well have looked at the United States, where the Auto Ordnance Company in 1919 would have been on the cusp of actually producing and shipping Thompson submachine guns in 45 auto and I could see certainly the British and the French purchasing Thompson submachine guns from the United States in 1919. Now if that's not an option, would the British opt for 455 Webley automatic over 9 Parabellum? Because they did have a, for a rimless 455 Webley cartridge that would have worked just fine in submachine guns. It wasn't in large scale production because it was only used in a specific very small subset of pistols that weren't, not very many of were made. Uh, I think they would have been better off to go with 9mm Parabellum, because in either case they're going to be basically setting up manufacture of a whole new cartridge effectively to try and produce large amounts of it. And 9mm is effective enough in a submachine gun and allows better magazine capacity for a lot less weight. Um, I can't really predict which one they would have chosen, but I think they would have been better off to just nick the 9mm cartridge. They certainly knew about it. There were pistols in 9mm that were available in the UK prior to World War One. DWM was selling 9mm uh, Parabellum Lugers all over the place, so the British certainly could have done that. Next question is from Michael. says, we all know about the MP5 and the MP7. What were the MPs 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6? That's actually a pretty easy question to answer. So uh, the MP1 was the Beretta 38, uh, post-war versions of the Beretta 38. The MP2 was the Uzi. The MP3 was the MPL uh, from Walther. The MP4 was the MPK, which is the short-barreled version of the MPL. And of course we have HK's MP5. The MP6 I'm not 100% sure of. I have seen unsubstantiated or unreferenced allegations that the MP6 was the essentially the 4.6 millimeter PDW element of the original OICW system. That as a standalone gun it was given the designation MP6. But that's based on one sort of random internet reference that you can find if you do a Google search for MP6, and I can't find it substantiated anywhere else. So it seems reasonable, but don't take my word for it. The other four, the early ones, we're good to go. Um, I will also point out, I think I mentioned this in a previous Q&A, uh, there was also a, we know the G3 in uh, military service, there was also of course the G1, which was the FAL, and then the G2 and the G4, which were the SIG Sturmgewehr 57 and the Armalite AR-10, which were both tested by the Bundeswehr, but not adopted. But during the testing they got designation numbers. Uh, Strawman Group says, I recently purchased a KP-15 lower in OD Green, and want to know if you have any suggestions on paints that play nicely with the polymer so I don't damage or compromise it. Cool question. Uh, this is also a little bit outside of my realm, so in this case I reached out to Russell Fagan at KE Arms, uh, who is instrumental in manufacture of the KP-15, and he agreed to uh, do a little brief segment for us on painting KP-15s. Take it away, Russell. This is Russell with KE Arms, and I'm here to answer the question about painting your KP-15 receiver. KP-15 is made from 30% glass-filled nylon. It is a very chemically resistant material, so using traditional spray paints on it is not a problem. 
Here you're seeing some customer paint jobs on their KP-15 receivers or complete rifles. If you're going to do this yourself, make sure you degrease the receiver, particularly if you've already assembled and shot it with alcohol prior to applying paint. Also pay attention to the pinholes for the fire control group and the selector. Getting those parts back in if you clog them up with paint can be difficult. You may have to sand them or ream them back out. Spray painting your receiver does not void your warranty, but trying to make your parts fit back in it after it has been painted could if you do it inappropriately. If you want your KP-15 coated professionally, I recommend working with Weepley the Second. They are our authorized Cerakote vendor. They know the particular process is necessary for coating the KP-15 without damaging it in the finishing or baking process. I use a number of rifles Cerakoted by Weepley the Second regularly at action shooting competitions, and it does in fact hold up quite well over time. If anyone else has any KP-15 technical questions, you are free to email us at tech at kearms.com. We pride ourselves on being the most responsive customer service in the industry. I actually have a KP-15 at We Played the Second right now getting a really cool custom design pattern paint job on it that I'm exciting to, excited to post, but I'm not sure exactly when they're going to be done with it because it's a kind of complex one. Anyway, I'll post that on Instagram once it's finished. All right, next question is from Tommy. It says, short version, could you please speak to firearm trusts? Why people started using them? Are they a viable option now? Long version, I created a trust for registering my two suppressors, thinking A, I can skip the requirement for having chief law enforcement agent sign off, B, I can make my wife and kids trustees, so I can send the devices to the range with them rather than having to babysit them, on them myself. C, I can manage the trustees as needed at any time, adding people like sons-in-laws, sons-in-law, uh, and D, when I pass, the devices will belong to the trust still, my family can take possession without having to pay a tax stamp. Uh, so short version, I'm going to say you should actually head over to Matt LaRossier's channel. He's got a much better uh, coverage of things like trusts than I do, because he's a lawyer and that's exactly what he does. However, there are a couple points that I want to cover here. First off, your point D about uh, having items in a trust so that your family doesn't have to pay for a tax stamp to get them when you die. That's not an issue. Uh, if you own NFA items, when you die they transfer on a Form 5, uh, which is specifically for inheritance, and there is no tax due for that transfer. So um, you can dictate who they go to, goes to that person, no big deal. They'll have to go through the background check. Uh, they can't possess them if they're felons, but they don't have to pay the $200 tax to do it. Interestingly, that even applies to things like pre-sample machine guns. If you had an SOT, bought a pre-sample machine gun, gave up your SOT but kept the gun, because you don't necessarily have to give them up if it's a pre-86 sample, uh, and then die with that gun, you can pass that gun on to someone who's never had an SOT in their life via Form 5, and that transfer will go through just fine. No tax, no SOT, it's neat little subtle, not really a loophole, but a neat feature there. Now as to the whole point of NFA trusts, originally was based on the requirement that an NFA transfer application had to be approved by your local chief law enforcement officer. And this was a totally unconditional approval. There was no, uh, a, a sheriff or a police chief didn't have to give any reason to reject an NFA application. If they simply didn't like the idea of citizens owning NFA items, be they suppressors or machine guns or anything else, they could simply refuse to approve transfers within their jurisdiction and people were kind of just screwed. However, it, people realized over time that you can register NFA items to legal entities other than actual people, things like corporations and trusts. And if it goes to a corporation or a trust, there's a loophole, it doesn't have to be approved by your local chief law enforcement officer. And so that was the big incentive for trusts to be used, was my sheriff just automatically rejects all of them, that's totally unfair, screw that guy, I'm going to register it to a trust, and then I can actually get my legal machine gun. So this went on for quite some time, uh, and ATF got a little freaked out because apparently at least one person who was a felon was able to get their hands legally, well sort of, they, they got a machine gun transfer approved to them, 
because it went to a trust, and there's you can't do a background check on a trust, you also don't have to file fingerprints or photographs with a trust, because a trust as an entity doesn't have those things. Uh, so at least one felon managed to get a transfer approved. Now it's still illegal for that felon to possess uh, a firearm, much less a machine gun, but ATF kind of freaked out, and a compromise deal was arranged where the requirement for chief law enforcement approval was dropped from all NFA transfers, and in exchange uh, trust transfers uh, now had to include fingerprints and photographs of each person, each responsible person in the trust. So this made th this solved a problem for people who had uh, reticent law enforcement officials, and in and that side of I think that's a totally legitimate, absolutely should happen change. There's no reason that a sheriff or a police chief should have that authority without any reason. It'd be one thing if it was based on background check, and the police chief was like, oh no, that person's a felon, they can't have a machine gun. No, it was just totally personal whim. Uh, however, there were people who had built up really complicated trusts with a whole bunch of people who got the idea that like, we'll have our entire gun club in a trust, and we'll register a machine gun to the club, and then anyone can possess it. Um, and I'm not suited to get into the entire, to all the legal details of how that works out, but a bunch of people had done it, and then when this change happened, they discovered that if they want to, say, add another silencer to that trust, now they got 50 people in the trust, they have to go get 50 duplicate sets of fingerprint cards to send in for that transfer, and it made some of those transfers really totally impractical. Overall, I think we are better off with the current situation than the previous one because uh, I think it fixes a fundamental problem that law enforcement officers had too much uh, random authority over the process. But that's what changed, and that's why it changed. And for further uh, details, again, I suggest you head over to Matt LaRossier's channel, because uh, his explanation is going to be more accurate on legal technicalities than mine. Our next question is from James, who says, Has there ever been a gas-operated semi-auto pistol design in which gas is vented from a fixed barrel into a slide which also acts as a piston? What you are describing there, James, is a direct gas impingement design, like a French Moss 49 or a Swedish Jungmann. And as far as I know, there has not been a pistol design like that. There are, very, there are a few, but very few, gas-operated pistols. I'm not aware of any that are direct gas impingement. There's probably something out there that was done as an experiment at some point, but I'm not aware of any that ever got into production. Nat says, you're traveling back in time and can prevent the assassin assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by arming and equipping, uh, arming and training his security detail. What weapons available in 1914 do you equip them with, and what training do you give them? I disagree with the premise of the question. I don't think any amount of training or armament would be sufficient to save Archduke Ferdinand. The problem, the thing that led to Archduke Ferdinand being assassinated was his interest in riding in an open-topped car and being up close and personal with a population that had a substantial percentage of people who really didn't like him. Uh, no matter, like, he was, he was assassinated because, and by the way, uh, Dan Carlin's podcast on the history of World War One. the first episode, has a fantastic description of how this assassination went down. But in essence, they tried to assassinate him by chucking a hand grenade at his car. It ended up wounding people in the car behind him. They then detoured. Uh, they wanted to go to the hospital to see those people. Uh, the car ends up taking a wrong turn, gets into this uh, dead-end road, driver has to shift the thing into reverse, which is a little tricky with a car in 1914. The assassin's uh, princip happens to be right there at a cafe where Ferdinand's car essentially stalls out and gets stuck for a minute, runs out and just caps him with a 32. Uh, with the level of exposure to the crowd, there's no way that his security team could have prevented that from happening. The way to prevent it from happening is to not let Ferdinand drive in that sort of procession, or at least put him in an armored vehicle, uh, you know, car with bulletproof windows, where he couldn't just be assassinated by any random person on the street. And I think we see that with a lot of other assassinations. Uh, was the Secret Service protecting Kennedy better trained and better equipped than Franz Ferdinand's bodyguards? Absolutely. 
but you again have this situation where he's in the middle of a crowd in an open vehicle and he gets shot and there's nothing that that a security team can do to prevent that so doesn't matter you, his team might as well have been unarmed uh, next question is from Isaac, who says, does engine and propeller speed affect the rate of fire on aircraft machine guns, or is the difference too small to notice? Uh, it can. So there are two types of, and we're, I'm assuming, talking about World War I aircraft machine guns here that are firing through propellers. If a gun's mounted on the wing, it has no relation to the engine speed at all. But for those early World War I guns, there are two different systems that were used. There were interrupters and there were synchronizers. An interrupter is a, a mechanism where the gun is free to fire at all times except when the propeller is going across the muzzle of the gun, and then there is a mechanical block that prevents the gun from firing while the propeller blade is traversing the muzzle. The other system is a synchronizer where the gun only fires at discrete points in the propeller's travel. Basically, once the propeller clears the muzzle, it trips the gun to fire. An interrupter the engine RPM really has no significant impact on the rate of fire of the gun. It'll be a little staccato. Uh, you know, the faster the propeller goes, the more often the gun's going to stop and not fire. But for a synchronizer, you have this really neat system where as the engine RPM increases, so does the gun's RPM, until you hit the point where, well, potentially where you hit the maximum RPM of the gun, or if you hit a point where the gun can fire twice between uh, instances of propeller blade going past, and you can get this really interesting staggered graph of rate of fire uh, with synchronizer mechanisms. And that's, that's a subject for an entire video on its own, which I hope to do sometime um, if I can ever get access to intact you know, functional synchronizers that I can demonstrate on camera, because that's just a really neat little nerdy engineering area. Craig says, it is 1915 and you can assemble a rifle using the components of any rifle of the belligerent powers in any combination. What would you make? That's an interesting question. So we're talking World War I, not World War II. So I would say, um, I would start with the basic action from a Pattern 14 or, ma or Model 1917 Enfield rifle. Essentially this is a uh, cock on close Mauser style action. It's strong, it's reliable, it's really quite good. To that I would actually add a Carcano magazine, because I would have, if I have to choose from cartridges of the belligerent powers in World War I, I would go with 6.5 Carcano. I want a 6.5 cartridge because it's light shooting, uh, relatively low recoil, uh, very comfortable, and also accurate. I don't want 6.5 Japanese because it's semi-rimmed. 6.5 Carcano is a rimless cartridge, that'll work just fine. Um, and it's uh, like the closest thing we have to a modern intermediate cartridge. So it's less powerful than 6.5 Swede, which is a good thing for this situation. Um, I would then I would make it a carbine length gun instead of a rifle length World War I pattern. I would give it the stock and the handguard from a Type 38 Arasaka. Uh, the handguard, the grip has a, a bit of a semi-pistol grip to it that I find comfortable. The upper handguard effectively and very thoroughly covers the whole top of the rifle. It's going to prevent any sort of mirage on the sights, gives a good grip if you need to use it for bayonet fighting, generally slim and just handles very nicely. And then I would go with a pattern 14 style of sights. I would want a rear aperture sight. There are arguments that can be made for all the different styles of sights. For me, I like the marksmanship capacity of a rear aperture sight. Especially when we're talking a carbine, our sight radius is going to be reduced by having a relatively short barrel. I want the best possible sights I can. So that would be it. I would have a, a P14 in 6.5 Carcano with a six round... Oh, I kind of skipped past this. Uh, the Carcano magazine is there not just for the cartridge, but for a six round end block clip. I would rather use end block clips than stripper clips at this point, and the Carcano gives you six instead of five. Why not? So Carcano clips are invertible, doesn't matter which way you put them in. Uh, they're fast to change and they don't have the problem. You know, good stripper clips are fine, bad stripper clips are awful, and block clips are all pretty decent. So that's what I would do, and I think it'd be a really fun rifle to have. 
Panzermeister36 says, do you think underbarrel grenade launchers will ever completely replace rifle grenades? The former seem much more uh, versatile in terms of ammunition types, less brutal to shoot, easier to load, more convenient, uh, being always ready and not inhibiting use of the rifle itself. However, I'm surprised that rifle grenades are still being developed to this day. Is there some benefit to them that I'm seeing, or missing? Uh, the thing that rifle grenades offer is anti-armor capability. With a rifle grenade you can have a, the, the warhead of the grenade essentially as big as you want it. With an underbarrel grenade launcher you are limited to having everything contained within the diameter of the bore. And I don't know of any that are bigger than 40 millimeter. And you can't fit that much of a warhead in a 40 millimeter projectile. So the things that have you know, the shaped charge type warheads, you can only do that with a rifle grenade. Uh, rifle grenade is also going to give you more, uh, more range, because you can have that thing set up to rest the stock on the ground and have what would be brutal recoil from an underbarrel launcher that isn't a big deal because it's going into the ground instead of into the shooter's shoulder. Now there are downsides of course, as uh, you go over here. If you've got a rifle grenade on the rifle uh, you can't just fire the rifle if you need to in an emergency. But I think both systems have their place, um, and I think as long as we see, as long as the anti-armor capability is of use, and it really isn't against main tanks, but it certainly is against a lot of light vehicles. And I think we'll continue to see rifle grenades in service as long as uh, being able to destroy light armored vehicles uh, at an organic infantry level without alternative special weaponry is useful. Tiernan says, I'm sure you get asked this sort of thing plenty, but I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on where to get started towards working more hands-on with historical pieces, firearms presumably. I want to do this as a career, but I'm not sure who to reach out to first. I know I'd like some experience with parts fabrication and such as well, but my main fascination is less with uh, truly making a manufacturing venture and more with working with older pieces. That's tough. There's not a whole lot that I can point you to because there aren't really very many careers centering around playing with old guns. Uh, the one that would come to mind is a museum career, but I think if you if you go into that with an expectation of getting to play around with a lot of old guns, you may well be disappointed by the reality of working in a museum, because I think there's going to be a lot of other stuff involved and a lot less actually playing with guns than you might expect. Uh, what I would suggest is, honestly, find a career in something different that pays reasonably well, that maybe isn't your passion, but is something that you can do, that you don't find intolerable. And then develop firearms as a hobby on the side. Where you get access and opportunities to do things like a lot of playing with old guns, frankly where I was able to build the network of relationships necessary to run a channel like Forgotten Weapons, all comes from personal interactions with other uh, firearms owners. Uh, museum representatives as well, but honestly it's to a lesser degree. If you really want to get hands-on with old guns you're going to be looking at private collections, not museum collections. And to do that you have to get into the social circles of collectors. And there aren't really, you know, if okay if you're a, a firearms um, uh, agent for an auction company. Yeah, okay, that'll get you in, into that position, but you can only get that job by having the prior experience working with old guns and having those networks, those social networks established. So my recommendation, and this is how I got started in this, is get, get your money somewhere else, play with guns on the side, and as a young person spend a lot of time listening. Find people who know more than you do and hang out around them and absorb the knowledge that they have, uh, and use that to expand your own experience. That's how I got started in this. There were many years of going to gun shows or going to machine gun shoots where I was that young kid who got to carry all the ammo back and forth uh, for the old guys who owned the guns and had all the expertise. And that was invaluable. Uh, I couldn't be doing this today if I hadn't spent years uh, doing jobs that had nothing to do with guns and doing that uh, for fun as a hobby on the side. Sorry, it's probably not the answer that you wanted, but that's the only realistic one that I see to it. Uh, we are 
almost done here, we have three questions left. Next one is from Straker, who says, are you still involved with InRange TV? Uh, that is a good question. Not really. Uh, so I have been incrementally stepping back from InRange TV for a while now. The issue is simply one of time. I have a lot of ongoing projects. Of course Headstamp Publishing has become much more of a thing than I originally expected it to be. My original plan was to write a book on French rifles and have it published by someone, and that turned into starting my own publishing company. And I now have a lot, I've done a second book um, that we are getting printed right now on Chinese pistols, and we've got a lot of really cool projects from other authors that we're very excited to be producing, and all of those things take time um, and take attention. I've got an archival project that I'm trying to get, well I am, uh, revisiting from the early days of ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm anticipating making that public around the end of this year, and I'm really excited for the potential of that. But it will also uh, take a lot of time. I continue to do Forgotten Weapons six days a week, which takes a lot of time. And I simply got to the point where I didn't have the available bandwidth and the available time to dedicate to a second channel. So uh, Carl and I turned InRange over entirely to Carl's ownership and control, and there was a graduated period where I was involved in uh, in InRange videos less and less each month. Um, and at this point InRange is entirely Carl's operation. I wish him well on it, but I just don't have the time to be significantly involved in it myself. All right, our next question is from John, who says, My father has a VZ-24, Czech Mauser, uh, brought home by his uncle who served in the Pacific. The story goes that the Germans would send weapons from conquered countries to the Japanese. Do you have any information on this practice, and if so, what other countries and weapons were involved in the program? Uh, unfortunately that story is not true. There has long been speculation about Japanese contract VZ-24s, and unfortunately almost all the documentation on that that uh, order has been destroyed or lost both on the Czech end and on the Japanese end. However, we do know that in 1939 the Japanese government ordered, purchased, uh, 40,000 VZ-24 Mausers from Czechoslovakia, from Brno. This was, uh, fulfillment took place after the Germans had taken over control of the factory, but they allowed the contract to go through anyway. And it was a commercial purchase. So there are a handful of those guns that are actually documented in the US with provenance from Japan, because these, these guns have essentially no Japanese markings or other characteristics. The only way we know of what specifically were Japanese contract VZ-24s is by inference from serial numbers and guns that have specific uh, Pacific War provenance. So actually it would be really cool to get the details, to see some pictures and have a serial number from your uncle's gun. It would actually add, not trivially, to the scholarship on this subject. If you want to email me, uh, admin at ForgottenWeapons.com. I would love to be able to uh, put that out into the collector's community, um, just to add to the knowledge there already. But it was a contract for 40,000 rifles, executed in 1939. For what it's worth, uh, the Japanese government also purchased 20,000 K98Ks directly from Germany between 1936 and fulfillment in 1938. Now why were they doing this? We don't know exactly, because again the documentation at the Japanese end has been lost or destroyed, but most likely this was for use by the Japanese Navy. Kind of like uh, the Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS, or the Wehrmacht and the SS, uh, competing over arms production. The SS didn't get its arms through standard military channels in Germany. Well, the Japanese Army and Navy were highly, highly competitive with each other. And the Navy often arranged its own small arms outside of the general development purchasing channels of the Army. And that's why you have things like the contract of Carcanos, Type I Carcanos, uh, made for the Japanese Navy. It's why you have the Japanese Navy specifically making a copy of the M1 Garand at the very end of the war. And it's probably why we have the Japanese government buying Mausers from Brno and from Mauser. Uh, to equip units of the Japanese Navy that needed a small number of guns and were unwilling or unable to negotiate with the army to get standard Arasakas. All right, and our very last question is from Michael. It says, I have a question about the P90. How come it doesn't jam? And why are there other guns 
not adopting its style of magazine or cartridge. From watching your videos, I understand that usually if a magazine has some sort of gimmick, it jams or fails and is discarded. But the P90 looks like it works as intended. It does, and it is actually rather remarkable for that. It is a very unusual magazine to actually work reliably. And as far as I can tell, it does actually work very reliably. However, there are a couple specific details of the cartridge in the magazine that are required. Uh, the cartridges are all lubricated at the factory, and the cartridge has literally zero taper in the case body, which is basically not a thing on any other extant uh, pistol cartridges like that. Virtually everything that's intended for a self-loading pistol has a little bit of taper to it. And for a typical pistol magazine that's not that big a deal, but that's why you start to see a lot of submachine gun mags get a little bit of a curve to them, so they feed a little bit better. And the problem is the P90 magazine is totally straight and it holds 50 rounds, and if you tried to do 50 rounds in a magazine like that with a cartridge other than 5.7 you'd probably get some issues. Now it has been done, the Lanchester, there were some early Bergman uh, machine guns that had 50 round stick mags, but it's not the sort of thing we see done very often and it tends to be a little iffy on reliability. The P90 was able to do it because of the specific details of the cartridge design. Now why don't other guns use that cartridge? Basically because it's a very specialized cartridge. It's essentially, some people may take issue with this comparison, but it's essentially FMJ, it's centerfire 22 Magnum. Um, it is generally not a cartridge that's considered powerful enough for a handgun, or really even for a submachine gun. Uh, its value comes in specifically its armor penetration capability, um, and it's not, not a cartridge that has a whole lot of practical benefit over 9mm Parabellum. Uh, and you can see that. FN came out with a, a pistol for the 5.7, the FN 5.7, which was really kind of a, not necessarily a flop, but it really didn't take any big market segment because there's not really any benefit to it. Uh, H&K prototyped a pistol for their 4.6mm similar cartridge, but didn't end up even putting it into production, probably anticipating that it wouldn't really be all that popular of a thing. So yes, the P90 magazine is quite remarkable for the combination of reliability and unorthodox complexity that it has, but I think it's a situation that we aren't likely to see expanded a, a, a system that we're not likely to see expand to other uses, just because it is a very specialized application. So that is four pages of questions for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you would like to get your question uh, into the next q and I will point out that I do get literally hundreds of questions for these, and I can typically answer about 25. So there are always good questions that I'm not able to get to, but if you would like to submit yours, step up, help support the channel on Patreon, and when I am getting ready to put together one of these videos, I put out a request for questions on the Patreon channel uh, for people at the $2, or, yeah, it's the $2 and above uh, uh, patron level. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.